Some people I've seen pretty regularly, and a few I've just met. A uh, pleasure to have you all here today uh, for what I think will be a really informative session with uh, Jacqueline Murphy. And I know Jacqueline will probably provide additional details. Uh, but Jacqueline is with the State Library, and today we're going to talk about things that I think trustees uh, will have an interest in. And uh, by the way, just so you know, uh, this is also being Televised. That's not the right word. Stream. It's live stream. It's live stream. So it's live streamed over the internet. Just so you know, so the microphones I think may pick up and so on. So if you ask your questions, I do understand there may be a few in other areas you might be watching. And so uh, to pick up your questions, I think they're welcome to pick up your questions. If you have questions, we will come to that. Jacqueline. But Jacqueline Murphy with the State Library and. Um, has been uh, giving trustee workshops like this in other parts of the state. We're so pleased to have her here in Pueblo today with us. And uh, so uh, just without further ado, I'll have Jacqueline step forward. Jacqueline. All right. Thanks, John. Thanks for inviting me today, everyone. I see some familiar faces uh, from over the years, just uh, various statewide meetings. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, prior to joining the State Library as the consultant for public libraries and community development, I was in private practice as a local government attorney for about 15 years. So in that work, I was getting various types of community amenities built, like swimming pools, recreation centers, uh, open space, and libraries. And through that work, developed a passion for libraries, and that ended up being the last nine or so years of my career was working exclusively with libraries around the state. Uh, I formed a number of library districts and have consulted um, on operations issues and governance and library law. Although I'm not in a legal position with the state, it's a job where that background is very helpful for what I do now. Uh, and I usually like to get a sense when we, do, uh, when we meet with trustees how uh, long you've been on the board, little background about you. So if you don't mind, if we could do a little go around. Uh, and, and I also like if you have a favorite library memory, either uh, from childhood or your work on the board, um, feel free to share it. driving over. I, I visited your library uh, a few months ago. It's a great facility. Um, my name is Liz Schneider. I'm also from Spanish Peaks Library. Um, this is my second time on the board. I was on the board when we became, uh, when we built the new library. Um, and now I'm doing it. Um, I grew up in Denver, so my memory is the downtown library, the children's room that had the round of the which I thought was the I'm Roy Miltner. I've been a trustee for about five or six years. And uh, I think the excitement um, uh, here in Pueblo around this library has been fantastic ever since I moved here 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. I was on the uh, Friends of the Library Board first and then came up on this board. Great. I'm Marlene Brigger. I'm also from Pueblo City County Library District. I'm a trustee. Um, I've been a trustee, I don't know how long. <laughs> I'm in my second full term, and then I had done a partial term, filled out a okay. term before that. Um, my favorite library memory, I originally came from Minnesota. I've been here 40 years, but came from Minnesota, and when I was little, I went to a 
Children's Schoolhouse, and um, we had the bookmobile. And I loved the bookmobile because it brought books, and I could take home a whole stack, and it even came in the summer. So I love the bookmobile. Great. <coughs> I'm, pardon me. I'm Jim Stewart. I've been on board, I think, a little over eight years. I've served on all three public library boards, the Friends Board, the uh, Foundation. I'm still on the Foundation Board, and I'm a trustee. I've also <clears throat> been president of all those boards at one time or another. So uh, I've been deeply entrenched in the library for a number of years. It's a wonderful organization. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Great. My name is Frederick Quintana. I'm also with the Bobo City County Library District. Um, I'm in my fifth or sixth year. I've kind of separated those years out some, but um, that's about it. I think uh, I, I, along with Marlene, Marlene took my bookmobile story, but that's probably my favorite library memory, as, especially as a child. Great. So much. John Walker, and I'm the executive director of the Pueblo City County Library District. We've been here 10 years uh, in Pueblo, and uh, it's a great community. Uh, it's become home for me and my family, for sure. And uh, one thing I can say about Pueblo has many wonderful attributes, uh, the community at large, uh, but they really do support the library. And of course, as the librarian here, I really appreciate that. Jackson, I'm Nick Granisar. I'm uh, counsel for the Pueblo City County Library District and have represented for the last 12 years, I guess. Uh, my favorite library story is right here at McClellan Library when it was uh, the old McClellan Library. Mm -hmm. Saturdays and summers here. Very good. Uh, I'm the board secretary and the librarian and my favorite memory is from Pineville Library District, where I participated in somewhat of a summer reading program with fish in an aquarium. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Well, it sounds like we have a little variety and experience and, and time in the community, and uh, so that's good. So some of the information I give you may be basic and things some of you know, uh, but our goal today is just to give you an overview of the uh, basic governance and library law provisions uh, that we have in Colorado and some of the uh, main duties of the board distinguishing it sounds like this group from my conversations with John is pretty uh, in tune with what your role is in connection with the work of the district and the work of the director but um, we'll talk a little bit about that uh, everyone should have an agenda in front of them uh, just for the next hour and a half or so. Uh, so we start out with those board essentials, library law. Uh, we'll talk briefly about strategic planning because it sounds like that's an area you've got pretty well uh, in hand here with, with uh, your construction, pro uh, construction program and efforts underway there. A little bit about uh, the self-regulation and how the board checks itself to make sure it's doing its job well. Uh, staying current, so some hot topics that 
the types of questions and kind of the categories that they fall in for me and in my work at the state. Uh, and then a little time at the end for uh, Q&A and evaluation. But uh, we really do, I try to keep this interactive. And so uh, really, if you have questions as we go forward, I'm, I'm happy to take them. And uh, we'll just hopefully be greeting our library trustee friends in Los Animas who've uh, elected to uh, sit in today. Hopefully everything's coming through loud and clear. Yes. Okay. Sure. Let's see here. Just make sure it's turned on. Okay, I'll just juggle as I go forward here. Uh, so we'll again start out with board essentials, which I think uh, is the main uh, distinction we make between the work of the director and the board. And when I talk to tr library trustees throughout the state, I, I like to point out that the board is the what and the director is the how. And so uh, the main job of the board is to steer the ship of the library organization. And the director's job, along with the help of staff, is to uh, figure out the, the how. How, do, uh, how does the director and staff implement your vision and your, your steering of the library organization? So in your folder, you have uh, just some cheat sheets, if you will, primers. And I would say this uh, blue folder here, this is just a simple takeaway for you today. If you have a board packet that you tote back and forth to the meetings, some of the items in here are helpful to have uh, to add to that packet. But on the left-hand side, we have uh, best practices for library boards of trustees. And so the uh, sort of common, common summary, and on the backhand side, it's uh, six essential tasks for boards of trustees. These all arise from Title 24 from the library law, and uh, they fall into, if you look at the six essential tasks document, uh, they fall into six or so categories. So fiduciary, the financial well-being of the organization, governance, big picture, direction, and oversight, planning, outreach, fundraising, and staffing. And I think it's worth, I know this particular group had an interest in library law and in, in you kind of examining uh, yourselves as a board, looked at that as an area that you wanted to focus on. So uh, I included some, what we at the State Library put together as quick guides those are on the right-hand side of your folder. So if you just take one out with me uh, right now, it's titled Colorado Library Law, The Quick Guide Boards and Trustees. Does everybody find that on the right-hand side? So again, we're um, in Title 24, 2491-08, and if you, uh, look to the flip to the second page of that we have the powers and duties of the board of trustees so your job as trustees is very clearly spelled out in state statute in the library law so i had summarized some of the general categories that your work falls into uh, and and those all um, tie back to to these provisions that the Board of Trustees shall adopt such bylaws, rules, and regs for its regulations, for its guidance and governance of the library as it deems expedient, uh, have supervision, care, and custody of all the property and buildings, employ a librarian, and when they say librarian, they're referring to your executive director, submit annually a budget as required by law, and uh, in library districts, you're adopting the budget and, and making uh, appropriations, which uh, in the case of the folks we have in the room, your, your library districts, which are separate political subdivisions, you have your own uh, taxing stream. City libraries uh, are part of the 
uh, either a part of the general fund and, and are either funded through property tax or, or sales tax for the jurisdiction. Uh, continuing on, the Board of Trustees has the power to hold and acquire land by gift or lease. Uh, building buildings, which we know you're busy in the process of, uh, selling and conveying property, borrowing funds for library purposes, authorizing the bonding of persons entrusted with library funds, conducting an annual audit, uh, authorizing the purchase of materials, holding title, and doing all other acts necessary for the orderly, efficient management of the library, authority to enter into contracts, and then there's some provisions around uh, school districts and your interaction with them. So it actually, um, the library law contemplates that your main job is the adoption of policies around all of those duties that you have. And again, the director's job is to implement those policies for you. Uh, with, with the help of staff. The library law also talks about um, that duty specifically of the executive director and that uh, the, the director makes recommendations to the board for personnel, hiring and firing decisions of the library. And I bring that up because I just like to, uh, as part of pointing out the highlights of the of governance policy and library law. I, I like you to come away with some best practices or ways to avoid pitfalls. That's that's really my main goal for our time together. And the personnel uh, aspect is one where uh, I've seen boards run afoul of it somewhat. Uh, and and in, in our library districts, the uh, library director makes recommendations for personnel. The hiring entity is technically the district because the district's a, a politic, separate political subdivision of the state. It's a governmental entity. It has governmental immunity in the case of an adverse, adverse employment action. If, if that were to, um, if an employee were to um, take that step uh, and file an action against the district for whatever reason. Uh, so it's important that the hiring decisions, the, the general best practice I recommend is that, and, and you probably already do this, but having your employment decisions pass through the public meeting context and the board meeting, at least through an annual report uh, type of agenda item. Sometimes it's a consent, a cons consent agenda item uh, where just, depending on the size of the library, Again, it could be once a year where the director's making a report of, of the personnel changes for that particular year. Can everyone hear me okay? Are we doing well on sound? Okay. So that's one that I like to point out when we talk about the specific duties of the board and the director. Uh, board proceedings and minutes, I, I have some best practices around how library board meetings are administered and depending, especially when you have a construction project or something more high profile in the community, uh, sometimes you have your share of public comment and so having some guidelines for the chairman on how to handle that. Uh, I generally, when we're talking to, to library trustees, we, we talk about that you should never feel like you have to solve any particular um, constituents issue on the fly or on the spot in, in the board meeting, it's always best to uh, indicate that you'll take the matter under advisement and follow up with the necessary staff and provide uh, that staff person uh, and or the director will follow up with them directly. Um, because I've, I've had experience with boards where uh, they have a dedication and a concern for for the member of the public who's attended the meeting and, and feel that they should be able to solve it on the, on the spot in the meeting and that's pretty much always a bad idea. Any questions so far on governance? I, as I said, I heard from John that you had a pretty good handle on that area. Uh, the, yeah. 
Ladder, you can you can imagine that it would be rather cumbersome if, with every you know, especially a library system the size of Pueblo, it wouldn't uh, it would become administratively burdensome for that. I just like to point out that part of the library law that it talks about that the director makes recommendations for personnel, just so that the board is cognizant that technically. Uh, they, the, the district itself, the library district itself is the employer uh, and, and the board, those employment decisions are made by the district by and through the board, um, not, a per, not a particular individual in the library director or the executive director, just so that you're, you're mindful that you are an employer of all the staff. So should that be a formal board action or is receiving the employment changes in as part of the tactic, is that enough? In general, I think um, having the report given and, and having, uh, oftentimes I've, I've seen it as a consent agenda item. So if you're familiar with consent agendas, it's, it could just be a series of more perfunctory <coughs> items in the meeting that are taken care of by the swoop of one motion, basically. Um, because as the board, you're not in the business of uh, making you know, uh, distinct personnel day-to-day -day management decisions. That's why you've hired your director, because they have expertise in, in managing personnel and um, in, in deciding what types of personnel needs the library organization has. So, so you don't need to get bogged down in that as individual trustees or as a board. Yeah, I think I like the way we do it here. I, I, I think it satisfies this is every quarter we, we meet all the new employees and also um, meet employees who have been here for two, one year, two years, three years, so that so we as a board have a sense who the employees are, who the new hires are, and although we don't take a formal action on them, uh, we are given that information. I think that's good, and it's it it um, yeah, I think it, it it is the form you know it is the acknowledgement of your role as the board as the uh, employing the district as the employing entity. I think that makes a lot of sense. So. So again, um, just good to keep the uh, essential tasks handy for going forward. Keeps in mind what is distilled down into your, into your role as trustees. The other reference I wanted to point you to, uh, just a little, uh, again, something handy to have in your board packet. This is a Board of Library Board and Trustees Pocket Handbook that I put together. And so this is a good uh, handy reference just with, with the basics of the various categories, types of boards in Colorado, duties of trustees, board meetings, intellectual freedom, trustee in the community, resources, golden rules, and Colorado library laws. So again, a good one to put in your meeting binder. So we'll take a few minutes now um, and talk about library law, how libraries are governed in Colorado, and some of the other important provisions uh, to be mindful of in your work as a library trustee. So the overall legal framework is Title 24. And when I'm uh, traveling throughout the state and, and working with different libraries, a lot of times we hear the library district referred to as a special district. So is everybody familiar with special districts in your jurisdiction? When I hear those, and that was actually my prior life when I worked on some of the other types of community amenity projects, uh, we may have interface with a 
water and sanitation district or a fire district, uh, park and recreation district, and also Title 32 metropolitan districts. Uh, all of those, you know, especially including the latter, obviously, are governed by Title 32. So in, in Colorado parlance, uh, special districts are usually, when people are talking about special districts, they're talking about those types of districts. So I like to highlight that so that when you're out in the community talking about the work of the library, uh, you don't necessarily refer to it as a special district because those are really different animals. And when we, when I'm at, across the street from my office at the legislature and other places, uh, when the legislators hear special districts, that's what they're thinking of, are uh, the fire, water, and sanitation park rec recreation. So just referring to yourself exclusively as a library district and not a special district is a good best practice. So again, we're, uh, as libraries, governed by Title 24 and library districts in particular, as we all are here in the room. The city libraries are governed, uh, also have provisions of Title 31 that pertain to them for cities and county libraries, uh, Title 30. So again, I'd highlight um, the quick guides that we have in the folder for you. Uh, I'm not going to go through and parse each section today. This is more just for you to have as a reference in the future. But we have um, a quick guide. The one that we looked at a couple minutes ago together was just for uh, boards and trustees where your, your basic duties are listed. Um, but there's also one on the right hand side that's called Colorado Library Law, the quick guide. And that is going to cover or, or be a brief summary of all of the, the various provisions. So uh, just to highlight a few, the power and the duties of the state librarian, who is my boss at the state library, Jean Hayner. Uh, there's provisions for how existing libraries can uh, participate in the formation of new libraries. There's a provision um, about halfway down this page, 106.3, inclusion of a governmental unit into a library district. And I know in the case of Spanish Peaks, that may have been something that's been looked at over the years um, in terms of, you know, you have your separate library district, but there's also other neighboring library districts in nearby counties and sometimes uh, boards look at whether they should do something more regionally and maybe be included or incorporated into another district. Uh, so I just happen to know that's something that's come up here and there over the years. Uh, there's a provision for removal of a municipal library when you're forming a library district. Uh, this is something I worked with in my prior life when I um, was with the law firm, but although you can include broaden your service area and include other areas into your library district, you cannot exclude from a library district. Um, and that's different from Title 32. Title 32 has a very specific process that goes through the district court where properties can be removed and essentially um, the operating tax for the entity uh, is, is removed from those particular properties. We don't have that for library districts. It's um, been litigated a couple of times and uh, there aren't a lot of cases construing the library laws, as I'm sure your council knows. Um, this is one where, in my experience in the mid 90s, uh, well, actually closer, closer to 2000 and early 2000s, as budgets, city and county budgets were becoming more constrained, we saw more and more jurisdictions looking at forming a library district because they knew they had their various municipal powers. So fire and police, uh, public works, human services, a uh, variety of, of, of basic municipal services. So they may have been looking at forming a library district so that that particular service, the library service could be segregated into a library district and have a separate tax stream for it. When that happened, 
more and in more and more places, we saw that our library districts were starting to butt up against each other. And uh, at that time, actually in around the 2009 time frame, I had the opportunity to draft some changes to the library law that would make it um, more clear for new library districts being formed where the boundaries were of the existing library districts because prior to that time there wasn't a requirement to file any maps like you would with a Title 32 or other district. So we now have that uh, requirement. But around the same time too, um, there, it became clear that uh, when a library district was formed uh, and also when annexations were taking place in certain cities, there was a miss perception uh, or misunderstanding on the part of some of the counties that when an annexation took place that the property in the library district dropped out and, and so some of the counties were uh, basically removing a library district tax with no legal basis to do that and so there's there um, have been at least a couple of cases that have dealt with that but I just want you to be aware that is one major area where we're different from the special districts that I mentioned in the Title 32 districts because they have a very clear process for exclusion. The reason, um, the policy reason behind why we don't as libraries, uh, I think is that we embark on these long range strategic plans and construction of buildings and so uh, with that duty that you have as a board to, to do that long-range planning uh, and staffing of the buildings, you can't be making those types of commitments and, and pledging the tax revenues to those types of projects if it's possible, you know, within the legal framework for, for cities to be pulling out properties out of the tax base. So. Um, you know, at that's at least, I think, one of the policy reasons behind why uh, libraries are different in that regard as taxing entities. Uh, so I won't go through, there, there's um, the provisions for method of establishment for a library district, and you've all successfully done that, so uh, we don't need to cover that. But again, um, we talked about Board of Trustees, the specific duties, there is a provision for regional library authorities, and again, that's something, the general concept with authorities is you have different taxing entities and they can agree by intergovernmental agreement to join forces and pool their tax funds. So we do have that ability to do that with our libraries, although that provision, to my knowledge, has never been, uh, never been used quite yet. Uh, when we go to mill levy election, uh, section 112 uh, require, specifies the me methods for that, but as a library district, the board can call the election, uh, request that the county cause the election to be held, and um, the board takes its step to do that through uh, calling the election. Uh, let's see. Those are the highlights, I think, of, of the library law. Some of the others are pretty specific to uh, grants and, and capital facilities and state publications, which you can look at later if you need to. Any questions so far? Exactly. Yeah. Would you, uh, at one point, I started to sort of look at the library capital facilities district. Oh, okay, you are interested in that one. That? Sure, that's one. I've not had much experience in the, um, what prompted that provision, uh, but, it, but it does allow um, for a capital facilities district. So that's specifically for the purpose of capital improvements. So brick and mortar, as opposed to uh, having the district for the operations mill levy purpose, um, which is used for staffing the buildings and all the things in it. So that would uh, have to do with the actual capital improvements. Anything else so far? Yes, Phil. Um, just the issue 
information on the uh, information that we're going to for a virtual library. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about that? And also, um, how do we keep up? I mean, how do we keep up with the constant changes? And is that kind of uh, constant change um, concept built into the law under uh, 24-90? When you're talking about changes, are you talking about um, in the internet and, and e-book wise, or what what kinds of changes are you wondering about? I guess I guess the uh, thing I'm thinking about is that the general belief is that technology moves very quickly okay. and constantly um, makes things out of date. And, and you know, of course, we don't see. The that despite the changes that go on with technology, they still apply. They <laughs> actually like like that. Right. That's a very good question, and I usually talk about it when we talk about open records and open meetings or the Sunshine Laws, uh, mainly because that is a, sh a, a very clear example of where the law has not caught up to the way we do business now, which is mostly by email. Um, but. It, do you want me to go back to your question about the Colorado Virtual Library first and then uh, yeah, and go back? Okay. Um, the, I think it's pretty straightforward for this one. This is a, an office within our unit at the State Library and so the Colorado Virtual Library, this provision was uh, included to allow basically for, um, we have our own interlibrary loan system that we administer through the State Library. There's also Prospector and other uh, statewide uh, interlibrary loan systems, but this is simply um, one that was created at the outset for the State Library to administer. But to your broader question of do our state statutes change quickly enough and how would you track that to keep up with technological uh, changes. Uh, I'll just take a minute to talk about how the open meetings and open records statute unfortunately does not, uh, does not do that. Um, and I think this is a good, this is actually what, what I was going to next anyway. Uh, and so we've talked about just the general framework for, for governing libraries, which is Title 24. Open meetings and open records are referred to as the Sunshine Laws, and those are generally applicable to your city, to your county, and all of your taxing entities and districts, uh, including the library district. So the main pitfalls um, that I like to help you avoid here, again, Phil, um, this is one area, the Sunshine Laws have clearly not caught up with the way we do business because uh, I get the question fairly often about how uh, boards can interact via, via email. And so um, in terms of the open meetings law, that says if you have a quorum or three board, mem board members discussing district business or public business, you have a meeting that needs to be posted for, minutes taken, et cetera. So the pitfall that um, is to be avoided here is, is having uh, email interaction amongst the board in and through and between the various board members um, because it usually starts out as there's a policy issue or something that is on an upcoming agenda and one board may member may contact another. They may bring in a third by email and before you know it, you've created a public meeting via email without even fully realizing it. Uh, and so um, I will point out there's, there's a social gathering exception to this. So, so when we say if you have a quorum or three board members in a discussion, um, it's not going to apply in the case of you know, a summer barbecue or you run into each other at the supermarket or that type of thing, um, but when you have the quorum or three of the board discussing public business, which often happens via email, you have a meeting. So the, the way to avoid that pitfall and the best practice I point out is to have your communications flow from 
each of the individual trustees to the director. And so if, for example, you want a certain item on the agenda, you would ask your director, Monica or John or Paula, to, uh, to administer that. And if there's questions or issues related to it, the director can communicate with the board as a whole. And then it's a communication between the director and each individual trustee. It's not engendering a conversation of the board as a whole. So um, best practice tip number one is, is again, to flow those uh, district business conversations through the director. Secondly, be careful about uh, using reply to all in any uh, discussions that you may be having around library district business. Do you have a question, Phil? Yeah, okay. Just to follow up, you, you're talking mostly about email, right? Right. What about Skype? Uh, good question. That's, that's the other one I like to point out is, is not where state law has not caught up to how we do business. The general best practice there uh, is that a, any taxing entity, and, and, th and this would apply to the cities, counties, uh, any other types of districts, that there be a quorum in the room for the public meeting. Others could participate in the meeting by phone or Skype, but the critical piece is that there be a quorum in the room for district uh, approval of district action items. So, so there's not a quorum in the room, but there's a quorum uh, on the participants of Skype. In other words, they're not in the room mm -hmm. uh, as a group to constitute a quorum. That's not covered. Uh, it's not specifically covered, and, and that is why I'm uh, relaying it to you as a best practice. And the way I analogize it is because the Sunshine Laws apply to you as a library district, any other district, and the cities and counties, if you took it to the extreme and you showed up at a county commissioner's meeting or a city council meeting and there was a phone or computer, computer monitor in a room full of public and everybody, all of the uh, taxing entity decision makers decided to phone it in or Skype in, uh, the members of the public in the room are at a disadvantage because there is a lot that they gain from when a vote is taken, for example, being able to see uh, and hear the way the vote has progressed, how the board members interact with each other, facial expression. And so because it's one of those slippery slope kind of arguments where if you read the Sunshine Laws that way, that you don't necessarily need the quorum in the room, what type of public meeting context does that give you and what does that say about transparency for the public? And so that's why the best practice that I recommend is to have the quorum in the room. And others may participate, listen in, uh, be um, involved in the meeting via Skype or um, speakerphone. But, but again, the key is having the quorum in the room. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it helps. Okay. Uh, so then on the case of um, open records, there was actually a change in the, in the law recently. Uh, this legislative session, many taxing entities, uh, they, they get, there's the Colorado Open Records Act, so you might hear that your organization has gotten a CORA request. So someone may, might be the, lo the local newspaper, they might be looking for copies of your financial reports or minutes, uh, copy of a, uh, an agreement approved by the board. And under um, Colorado state law and some of the cases that construe the Open Records Act, the taxing entity can charge uh, not only a per page fee, but also uh, if there is time spent compiling the data and extracting the data that the requester is asking for. Uh, and I am actually not very familiar with what prompted the specific change this year, but I suspect um, so sometimes, again, the local news outlets 
may be looking for information and when they go to the city or they go to the library district or other taxing entities, they may be getting very different schedules for um, receiving copies of those documents. And so what the law now requires is that if you're going to charge that kind of fee for the service of, of compiling the public records they're asking for, that you have a policy for that and that it be published before uh, making that a requirement of a, of a CORA request. So I, um, on the topic of, of policies too, and we'll talk about those for a few, a few minutes as well, I have a policy bank uh, on my page at the state website and I try to collect some samples there. Uh, and I'm working on right now one for open records that will have this change in the law, this most recent change incorporated. And I've had a number of libraries uh, looking for that. So if that's something you're interested in, I can send you what uh, we come up with there. So continuing on, um, the other uh, generally applicable provisions, aside from just the library law, are um, table, Gall Tabor, Gallagher, and Mill levies. And I won't spend too much time on this because I know um, you have a highly competent finance director and Chris Brogan who um, probably does a separate uh, session on that for you or, or is a resource for that. Um, but the Division of Local Affairs, which is a sister, rather state agency to ours in the State Library, also has some good resources for that. Uh, Title 29 requires our libraries to file and our library districts to file a budget and audit annually. And the budget time frame is generally in the fall and it starts when the county certifies uh, or certifies the assessed valuation of all the property in the county um, in August. And then you build your budget from there in the fall. Uh, Audits are generally in the summer time frame, uh, required to be filed by July 31st, and those are required if your expenditures uh, exceed $500,000. So, uh, privacy of user records is actually uh, in Title 24 in the library law, and this is one, I was doing a training for Douglas County and they relayed a scenario to me um, basically this, I'll, I'll tell you what the provi provision provides and then you can see how it played out here, but they found a teen dead in a field near the library, one of their library facilities, and the only identification that they had happened to be their library card. So the sheriff's department was um, investigating and they brought the library card into the facility and staff um, cited the, the privacy law, which says that uh, a library can't disclose that or what a patron has used um, in the library without a written subpoena consent in the case of a minor or if necessary for the reasonable operation of the library. So in that case, staff had to indicate that the sheriff's department needed to get a subpoena. Uh, for the information and I think in that case the sheriff's department probably figured out they could go as if they were checking out a book and obtain some of the information from the card that way I think that's what ended up happening but um, this is an area or a pitfall for staff because there these things do happen you know a larger library system like the one we're in today you may have security cameras on library property or in the parking lot and bad things happen. Uh, thefts happen, um, various you know, incidents on library property. And so the share, local law enforcement is often really frustrated because they come into the library and they find a staff member and they're you know, basically looking at it like, I'm a public entity, you know, you're a public entity, we work for the same people, I need some information. Uh, why, why, why aren't you working with me? Uh, and so we try to educate library staff around the fact that this provision is in the Colorado Library Law and State Statute because libraries uh, of their, because of libraries' very nature, that they are uh, places for freedom of expression and equal access. And with that freedom of expression comes an expectation of privacy. 
And so this has been built into state statute. So we, we try to help our library staff avoid any pitfalls with law enforcement by explaining to them that I want you to be able to use whatever information I give you uh, to have the full resolution of, of the matter. And so if I give it to you without following state statute, then it may jeopardize your ability to use it and I, I as a public entity don't want that. So that often helps to, it's usually an education issue um, between library staff and local law enforcement, but it's uh, quite interesting how often that provision comes up. And, and you're correct, that's a federal um, that's a federal framework and a federal law. The one I'm talking about is state statute. It's actually in the library law. So and this is a tough one I think too. It's it's um it's a customer service issue. It comes up with holds, you know, husbands and wives trying to pick up holds and just trying to do basic life stuff. You know, you run to the grocery store, you pick up the library books, and so um, it can be a frustration for patrons too. Um, so it's it's something you know, having your policy around it to be what can allow you to meet your customer service expectations and the law at the same time is the key. Uh, so just a couple more things on on the overview of the legal framework. Uh, the First Amendment in the library, uh, this issue, this particular constitutional provision comes up a lot of times in our use of spaces like this in the meeting room. Uh, we mostly, uh, the best practice of course in your policy is, is to call out you know, what the law would require here, which is that your meeting room and any um, library property is uh, available on an equal basis. Uh, equal access, so not distinguishing between different users and, and who may or may not use um, the meeting room facility. Comes up sometimes leading up to an election cycle. Uh, you making sure that if you have an election uh, designated area for election materials that there is, that it is made available to both the, the uh, Camp, the yes campaign and the no campaign. Uh, so anything really around the library is a public, because it is a, it is a public forum. Uh, and additionally, um, there's the Lobbying and Fair Campaign Practices Act that would say if you were doing a mill levy increase, um, that's going to put restrictions on uh, you as a board in, in advocating for that measure. Um, and the policy behind that is that, um, and, and, and again, or I should say the, the restrictions kick in at the time that the ballot question is certified. So um, once that language is finalized, you're much more limited in what you can do. Um, leading up to that, it's, it, you have more flexibility in terms of being able to have community meetings and uh, educating the public around why the mill levy increase may be necessary. Um, but after that time, the, the policy behind it is that you wouldn't, it's, it's not appropriate to use taxpayer funding to advocate one way on a ballot issue because your taxpayers, the broad base of your taxpayers, some are for and some are against. So um, their, their resources and their resources in the board shouldn't be used to advocate one way or the other. Uh, some other pitfall areas. I've had questions at the State Library uh, where, where a patron has called me and said that um, they have uh, they've been told they violated the code of conduct in the library and they've been suspended. They've had their library privileges suspended and can you do something to slap the hand of that library or sanction the library? So I have to explain that 
we're a support agency for public libraries, um, not an enforcement agency. And so I refer them back to the code of conduct. But the main thing I, I like you to take away as a board um, and, and for library operations here is that um, it needs to be very clear to the patron what part of the code of conduct they violated and staff really should give them something in writing that points to the provision. Um, I was in, before I left the law firm, I was uh, working on a case with, with others where the patron alleged that they were illegally suspended from the library. And that was part of her argument, is that she did not know what she did wrong. And so having staff um, issue in writing, you know, pointing to that specific provision uh, that, that they did, their conduct that was unacceptable and, and outside of the policy. The other um, pitfall to avoid here is those suspension policies, depending on the size of the library, staff may be able to suspend somebody's library privileges for a day or a week uh, or a certain period of time. Longer time frames, maybe months or you know three to six months or more would be the decision of the library director. The other thing we learned from that case was that there needs to be a road back to the board if necessary um, because that's, that's the public body. And so I think in that case, there wasn't an appeal process back to the board from the decision of the director to suspend. So that's really um, a due process concept. So um, when, when I've looked at, at these types of policies, I just generally recommend that the decision of the director can be appealed to the board so that the patron uh, feels, the, the patron has a sense of transparency and, and again, due process there. Uh, board governance, uh, as library districts, you, your board is appointed by either the city or the county or cities or counties, depending on how um, the library districts formed. Whatever the forming entity was for the library district, they have the uh, continuing authority for um, filling the vacancies on the board. Many library districts recommend uh, candidates for filling the vacancies on the board. And those are presented to the county or the city, and then the city or the county uh, does the approval process for um, the positions. So, and that's important because library boards are appointed, uh, not elected, and so there needs to be a form of redress, again, or transparency, in that if, if there's a, a member of the public who doesn't like how, they're, how you are um, stewarding their taxpayer funds, they have redress through the city or the county that appoints you. And that has actually come up uh, recently with um, the Weld County Library. Well, it's actually called the High Plains Library District up, up north. They have kind of, that. well, they have a very unique structure where they're made up of a number of cities uh, that still that have advisory boards of each of the cities in addition to a library district board. So um, it's a little bit of a complicated structure, but they've had some recent um, media on some of the cities wanting to change the composition of the board. And so I just bring that up as a, a reminder of um, why that process is how it is. And uh, that's because you're appointed and, and elected and there needs to be um, taxpayer of, uh, mechanism for taxpayer redress. So those are, those are the highlights of library law and the other um, state law provisions that, that would apply. Uh, just taking a look at our agenda, we'll probably um, spend another 20 minutes or so. Uh, and so if it's appropriate, um, we can just take a quite quick five minute break if you like, or we can power through. What's the board's preference? Power through? Okay. And I hope our friends, our library trustee friends in Los Animas are, are able to stick with us here. 
So uh, looking at the uh, agenda, self-regulation wise, why don't um, you just share with me uh, what you all do to look at yourselves as a board. Um, I think me being here today is the result of, of uh, your process for that. Mm -hmm. to look at. Then the other part, we rate ourselves as a board. It has a variety of areas and questions. And I think we rate on a five-point scale, is that what it is? And um, that data is actually collated. And then we have a board development committee that looks at the results of that and um, uses that information to plan professional development opportunities. Like today, yeah. learning about a specific topic of right. trustee duties. That's quite comprehensive. That's, um, I, I could have you all go and talk <laughs> to some of our other boards about how you do that, um, because there's a number of them that don't, um, don't have an element, really, of looking at how well the board is doing its job. So and we've, oh, kind that's of, good. we've kind of tinkered with that set of questions. I mean, every time we go through it, it's like, oh wow, is this really something? Are we asking the right question here and that kind of thing? So, but, um, and sometimes it seems a little long, but, <laughs> right. but it's, you know, we look at the instrument too, I think that, that helps. Right. And is that done? Do you do that around the same time that you may be doing any other staff evaluations, or is that separate? It's generally the end of the year, beginning. Right. Kind of that it's November, December, January, December, January, December. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, well, that, that, like I said, that sounds pretty comprehensive. I don't think there's anything I could tell you that could really improve on that. Um, I think, and I would encourage. Uh, Las Animas and, and Spanish Peaks, uh, if to um, you know be thoughtful about that process too. I do have a form that I use that's kind of a report a report card of sorts, if you'd like, uh, that I can share with you for that. Um, so since we're not really needing to spend too much time on um, self-regulation, if you look at your agenda, um, so we've covered board essentials, library law self-regulation. Um, I'd like to take just a minute uh, on strategic planning, even though I know you're underway uh, very much so with your construction process and, and implementing your plan. But if you can bear with me a second, I'm going to try to bring up a link of ours. And actually, let's see here. I might have um, Jane, if you wouldn't mind passing out some more templates that I have. Uh, they're collated, so just um, they each get a set. And um, for our Los Animus, Los Animus trustees, uh, this is a set of policy templates we'll get to in a couple minutes um, if you happen to have copies of those. I just wanted to make sure that this link came up. Oh, sure. oh, there it is. And I think we tested the audio, so. Yeah, yeah okay. I tested the audio. Okay, so we're. Um, I was just taking advantage of that minute to um, have Jane pass out some of the policy templates, which I'll get to brief uh, shortly. But before we do that, 
Uh, we'll talk about um, just the strategic planning item we have on the agenda, and that's about understanding um, the community you serve and bridging between planning and results. So I'd like to play you a quick video from the State Library. contain a number of goals. One of them is to promote quality library service throughout the state. Sorry, that's okay. Also to inform community users yeah. about what they can expect from their library. And to assist libraries in connecting with the communities that they serve. We also hope this provides an authoritative document for administrators, supporters, and boards to refer to when requesting funds or building your budget. And finally, to assist you, the board, the staff, and the directors in planning and training in your library. These standards represent a snapshot in time. Library planning and operations are inherently fluid, responding to what is sometimes a rapidly changing social, fiscal, and technological environment. This document then is intended to inform, but not replace, a library's strategic plan. The standards identify key issues, services, and best practices in Colorado public librarianship. We recommend that library directors review each one of the standards and then engage their boards, the community, and your staff in the process. This document provides information to help libraries plan and evaluate their services and meet the needs of their users in the most effective way. So just to share with you, there's a spiral ring binder document there um, called the Colorado Public Library Standards. Just to give you some background, those uh, were created in 2011 by a task force of libraries throughout the state and um, we're focusing a lot today on Colorado library law and governance and so I just point this out to you these are not uh, strict regulations of any kind um, but they're the result of the work of this task force and I think provide some pretty good benchmarks for you going forward uh, in general with your strategic plan what about what um, year are you within like what what range do you cover with your plan it's about five years and we're, we're about to complete our second plan so we'll be doing a new strategic plan as the board knows sort of begin at the end of this year and into next year. okay okay so i just give this to you as a resource um, when you embark on that update to your current strategic plan again these are um, good benchmarks for going forward and um, that's a service that we provide free of charge um, through library through the library development team that i'm on is assisting libraries uh, with strategic planning and facilitation so again that's that is a resource to have in your back pocket so we have covered uh, board essentials, library law, strategic planning, self-regulation, staying current. Um, some of the hot topics, this is where I, I talk about um, how we keep our libraries relevant and some of the types of questions that I get. Uh, I actually presented at the Colorado Counties Conference yesterday. Uh, and that's the first time that that group has ever had a library presentation as part of their conference. And so um, it was pretty exciting. There was a pretty good uh, group interested in libraries there. We've had a session at the Colorado Municipal League for a couple few years now. And so uh, a big part of my job is talking to non-library folks about our Colorado libraries. And so. Um, being able to, you know, describe a 21st century library and what it looks like to those those types of uh, decision makers is really important. Yes. If you'll permit me to back up just a moment. I sure. 
something in regards to strategic plans is worth mentioning. I think a lot of boards, when they do a strategic plan, think of it as a necessity that they have to get done and then stick it on a shelf someplace. One thing that this organization has done, and I think it's uh, been crucial to its success, is to, when, when we do our planning each year, have our planning retreat, one of the questions that's always asked is, does this fit our strategic plan? If it doesn't fit the strategic plan, then either the strategic plan needs to be perhaps changed or modified, but basically it needs to fit that plan. It's the goal, of the strategic plan is the goal of where we want to be in five years, basically. Mm -hmm. And if you don't keep your eye on where you're going, you're not going to get there, for sure. Right. And I think that's one of the biggest problems with strategic plans is not thinking of it in terms of this is something we really want to do, we want to be there in five years, and we're going to make every effort to reach it by continually evaluating where we are against that strategic plan. Mm -hmm. That's allowed this, this library district to be building three libraries this year. Those libraries have been on our strategic plan for a number of years, mm -hmm. but we've kept our eye on that goal, and now we're finally accomplishing it. So I I think that's one of the most important things about a strategic plan. Don't think of it as something you, a job that you get done and then forget about, mm -hmm. but rather something that use, is used as a guide to make sure you're on track to getting where you want to be as an organization. I think that's a great point. We talk about that when we facilitate strategic planning, that it's not just a document that you do and stick on a shelf. A best practice we recommend is probably what you are already doing from um, being underway is having the mission and vision of the organization on your meeting agenda every month and uh, having specific items say your strategic plan boils down to three main goals having those goals listed at the bottom of the agenda can be a really good way to keep yourselves accountable uh, to that plan. In fact, um, I'm thinking of Spanish Peaks. We uh, had the opportunity to facilitate some strategic planning with your board uh, a few months ago. So that I think is culminating in, in an actual written document. So that's exciting. Yes. Very good. Yes, it sounds like this board is, is on track with some really good processes, so that's really encouraging to see. Uh, again, in terms of uh, staying current and, and hot topics as trustees, we've kind of peppered these throughout, um, but the, the governance topic, I talked about the appointment of the board, um, that is something that they've been dealing with up north. Um, in, in the media, uh, so board governance, the Sunshine Laws, we talked about the recent change in the law there, uh, library district formation is one I still get a lot of questions about and do uh, consult with city and county staff if they have questions and, and would like to do an education session on whether that makes sense for them. So um, if you know of neighboring jurisdictions who are a city or county library and they want more information on that, I'm happy to do it. A lot of the hot topics or questions uh, that I get have to do with policy and policy drafting and revisions. And so uh, again, since this group was interested in focusing on library law today, um, we, we recognize that that is the main muscle that you have to flex as a board is your power to adopt policies for the district. So um, I'll take a minute and show you what we have in the way of resources 
on our page and uh, I had had Jane pass out and I think Paula hopefully you got this as well uh, some templates for policy review So on, um, this, this is actually my page at the State Library, and so the policy bank that I was referring to is here. There's a board and trustee information section, legal issues, strategic planning, resources on partnerships, and uh, The policy bank is resides on this page as well if you're looking for sample policy language and so what I'd like to do now is just take a few minutes as we close out to uh, let you practice flexing that important muscle that you have as part of the library law which is to adopt your policies and um, just gather in a group of two or three if you would and uh, we're going to just take a minute to do an exercise um, with your group as well, Paula. If you look at the templates that Jane handed out, there's a mind map that looks like this. It's a, a sheet that's got the rectangular boxes on it. Um, this is the universe of policies that you would have jurisdiction over um, as, a, as a library trustee. And I like to give you this because it, it kind of gives you a laundry list or a checklist of, of where your policies fall. You probably have a form of these in your uh, policy manual with the library. But when we talk about policies, uh, we also, we talk about that the board in the library law has the power and uh, duty to adopt bylaws and policies. So just a clarification, bylaws are the document that govern how you govern yourselves as a board. Policies are the documents that govern how your organization governs itself. So uh, again, this is your biggest job, I think, in the library law um, as a trustee is to adopt policies. So what um, we like to take a couple minutes practicing is um, in your groups of two or three, you can choose a policy you might want to talk about from this mind map and you can see they fall in three different categories so there's human resources policies so how leave is governed uh, and evaluations on the right hand side on the left the fiscal policy so what chris brogan um, for pueblo is administering how you invest the taxpayer funds uh, purchasing so Depending on the library system, some fiscal policies will say the director has authority to issue checks for up to $5,000. Anything beyond that has to go through the board. Depends, again, on the size of the, the library system. And then the third category are the operational policies. So these are the really juicy ones of meeting rooms, internet, uh, filtering, displays and exhibits, code of conduct how you deal with unattended children in your library, uh, and social media. So I would have you just um, in your groups or two, of two or three, pick one from this sheet that you might want to talk about. And in the templates, there's also a um, policy worksheet that's blank like this. And just take a few minutes and you can see that um, what this template requires you to do is be thoughtful about your policy and think about what kinds of definitions you need to create and the kinds of questions you need to ask yourself as a board. The other sheets um, are just here for your reference if you ever do a policy workshop like this, but they show you how you would use these templates and fill them out. So in this case, we chose exhibits and displays 
So we had a board that wanted to look at how do we decide what kind of art we hang on the walls or what kind of other displays we're going to have in our buildings. And so it just shows you the types of definitions they created and the questions they asked that all resulted in a one-page display and exhibit policy. Um, so again, we'll just take the closing minutes to um, flex the policy muscle and, and let you talk about those for a couple minutes and then we'll close out with some questions. I think one thing that needs to be addressed is, and one of the things we struggle with on the board sometimes is the difference between a policy and a procedure. Okay. We quite often see procedures creeping into policies. Sure. And so would you address that? A bit? Sure. Um, the board's job is to come up with the basic distilled down policy and then the director, uh, with the help of staff often, translates that into procedures for staff. And so the procedures are more what staff will have at the circulation desk or um, at their fingertips. So for example, your policy might be reiterating the provisions of the privacy statute that we talked about. Uh, and then the procedures are actually what directs staff in how to implement that. So when law enforcement enters the building and requests information. Uh, you may have instructions to staff to provide a copy of the privacy statute. Um, or, you know, in the case of the code of conduct, if it's a potential suspension situation, it's gonna outline the procedures for making sure the patron's given in writing uh, the section of the code of conduct they violated and the, the clear written process for how they uh, can uh, investigate or, or appeal the decision of suspension. So the procedures are going to be more detailed. What you're producing as a board is, is the one page in a lot of cases or just the distilled down basic policy that comes from the library law. And I encourage you, because laws change, um, to look at your policies on a uh, periodic basis like you do with your strategic plan and so I like to offer these templates as a way for you to do that if you want to have a, a workshop in the future so um, we'll just take a couple minutes for you to take a look at that in your groups of two and three and again uh, close out with some questions Oh, thanks. No, I'm, I'm good. That's perfect. Thank you. 
take a minute to share. I, I'm always curious what piqued your interest? What um, policies are most on your mind? Um, maybe you can just share out from our groups. We, we chose unattended children. Okay. That's a good one with the summer months approaching, definitely. So did you identify any questions it might be critical to ask or, or definitions? What constitutes unattended? You know, is there an age limit? They have to be with an adult. You know, are they safe? Okay, excellent. How about this this group? Did you find any you would want to maybe focus on in a later workshop? Or well, we were just talking about how you know you can. I know there's a big book of policies. Right. And I was asking if we had them, and she said we do, and they need to be looked at from time to time to be updated because sometimes they don't go back and look at one until they have an issue and have to refer back to the policy. Right. It, it's generally part of your orientation as, as a board member having that packet of policies. How about this group? We talked a little bit about um, electronic device devices we do check out electronic devices, but there's always new devices coming up. We have three new libraries coming up, and um, are we going to have to handle checkouts or use within these branches differently or the same? Mm -hmm. You know, and that, and that leads into that policy and procedure piece and stuff, but I think any time you open a new facility, you have to think about do we need to change anything? Do we need to go back and look at that? Policy? That's a great point because of, you know some of our libraries may be incorporating a maker space or other um, uses that are unique to what you've done before. Right. So, so looking at that. Um, again, I, I do try to keep the policy bank updated with what I think are um, good samples. I would encourage you, if you're looking for something and you don't find it there, to call me because even if it's not um, on the page, I generally know uh, one that has been vetted pretty well and, and can help uh, point you to that. So that's a good one. How about this group? Um, we consider uh, unattended children as well. Uh, thinking about the summer months coming up, was, and I think the biggest question that we asked or to consider were whether or not unintended, like unattended meant that the parent was completely not in the building or the parent was somewhere in the building but not really attending to the child. Mm -hmm. Kind of the safety issues that come along with that. Jack, one thing that we discussed that we've started to do with our board is we found that some policies tend to involve things that are more volatile than others, and therefore we've begun setting a date for review on the policy based
based on that volatility, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we adopt a policy, we set a date on by which it will be reviewed or when it will be reviewed mm -hmm. so that it doesn't get just shoved on the side. Right. This yeah, I'm really encouraged to hear a lot of the processes that this, that your board has in place. I think um, that's great. I, I will hold this Pueblo board up as a shiny example when I talk to other boards. So, um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of good processes here. Anything else on policies? Uh, what other questions do you have for me? If, if not, I, I have some for you. <laughs> uh, I'd like to kind of help us test what we know and I have prizes and sorry I can't give you the benefit of those um, our, our viewing folks but um, we'll get them over somehow uh, so I encourage uh, the viewing folks to, to be um, working collaboratively, collaboratively on these questions too. So uh, I'll just give you a few scenarios. A Number one, a wife calls in to ask what books her husband has checked out. She's about to leave home and pick up her daughter at school and would like to drop off any books that may be due at the library on the way back. How should staff handle this? Right, that's the privacy statute that um, we talked about. So, my little juggling act here. I said I had prizes, so. Oh. There you go. Um, okay, how about, uh, and, and this is in the policy realm, we at least, your, your mind map might be a reference for this. Just giving you a little hint there. Uh, an adult male patron wants to look at nude pictures of women on the internet in your library. He claims he's a budding artist and wants to be able to study the anatomy of a woman since he's drawing paintings. Uh, what policy might this invoke? What library policy might this invoke? Both, actually, yes, that's a good answer. So you have code of conduct over here, and internet filtering, right? Is that? Okay. How about um, what is the best practice or method if you have an item of district business, library district business you would like on the agenda? What should you do? That's right. So you have a local newspaper that is interested in looking at your uh, construction contracts that you have for one of your new buildings. And they're voluminous. Uh, what do you need to be able to uh, respond to that request? What do you need in place? Right, it's going to take staff some time to compile the construction contracts and um, do the copying necessary to get them to, you might, and, and of course in our world of business, doing business now, you might do that kind of thing electronically. Um, but again, this is the part of Cora that would say um, if you want to charge for the extraction of that information or the compilation of it, that you need to have a policy in place beforehand for what uh, 
what the library district will charge to comply for that, to comply with that request. Yeah, just to let our so board know, of course we do have a policy, such a policy, and what uh, Jacqueline was just referring to, the recent change to law, actually, I got the heads up from Jacqueline, and Dick's been reviewing that, we're going to, we'll be taking that up as a board uh, this month, uh, or, yeah, this month. So what we session. have to do is set like a per hour charge for extracting the information. Can't and exceed thirty dollars an hour is what the right. legislature said. Oh okay. And then a per page for the copying part of it. We already have the per page yeah. I think we can also charge for the yeah. or whatever you put, put stuff on. Oh, you do it like yeah. right electronically okay. Yeah, and that makes sense a lot of times. So. Jacqueline, what's yeah. your judgment about whether the requesting party can insist that the documents be sent electronically? statute doesn't require that, does it? No, it does not. Um, but I think uh, the main the main thing is it also it has always required just a response within a reasonable time frame, and so um, the end of the the public entity gets the request, and then um, if it's going to be beyond a three day period, if if it is you know voluminous copies that are needing to be made. Um, you let them know. For instance, the library here apparently got a request recently from a nationwide organization that says we want you to gather up this information and ship it to us electronically, which was going to be pretty onerous. We said, hey, make an appointment, come in and see whatever you want, and tell us what you want copies of, and we'll give it to you. I don't know whether you've heard from them since. <laughs> no. <laughs> so. Right. So. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I think you know Nick uh, there's a distinction here between public's right to know and a company out of Florida that's trying to make a buck and and, uh, and, I, and I'm not trying to make that distinction I don't mm -hmm. know if we were put in that position but uh, they were making an onerous request of us that we didn't we actually it would be very difficult for us to comply with in, in the full terms of their request uh, and so you know we, we said as Nick said you know come in and tell us what it is you want, you know, spell out what it is you want, and we'll uh, try to provide what we can, but we can't, uh, they wanted, uh, based, they wanted purchase records going back for years beyond what we have electronically. Mm -hmm. And basically what this company does is they resell it. They resell it to the companies who are, who are looking to sell to public entities. Which so they were going to make a buck on Probably so. I mean, that's that's their business is to, is to try to do that. But uh, that, that but so so there's the public's right to know, and we want to respect that for sure. And so, you know, what are the boundaries of order to check? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Don't we owe a different responsibility to the taxpayers of our district versus those outside the district? Not necessarily when it when it comes to the Open Records Act. Is that what you're asking yeah. about? Well, <clears throat> yeah, it just seems like people that are actually paying to keep this place open and operating have uh, it should be our first priority versus those that don't. From yeah, from a customer service standpoint, I can certainly see that. I don't know that the Open Records Act really makes that the kind of distinction. It's yeah, it's. Now. It's public, they're public records, so for the does. general public. Yeah. I don't think it makes that distinction. And I think that's what this company relies on, is the fact that the law doesn't make that distinction. Right. They, and that, I'm not, that's their right to do that, to request that information. And I think they're actually kind of going nationally uh, yeah. and uh, so requesting it for bodies all over the, probably the country, and, uh, which is fine. You know, that's, mm -hmm. that's the old American way. <laughs> it did put a particular burden on us in terms of their total request, and so we asked for more information, and they sort of dropped it at that point. They didn't really pursue it. I think they have other fish to fry. Well, good questions. Um, anything else? Any other questions? I'm, I'm always a resource for you here. Um, I, again, my job is to support all the public libraries throughout the state and community development to help 
you do your job better as a board and um, your libraries serve your communities. I'll just um, orient you to a couple other things that I'm leaving you with and they are, um, we've talked quite a bit about since the interest of this group was governance and library law, we've talked quite a bit about um, the open records and open, open meetings. I have a cheat sheet on the left hand side of your folder uh, for executive session. Um, we didn't go into specifics of that today, but um, that is part of the open meetings law that says public business needs to be conducted in, in public, um, in the sunshine, in the open, but there are cases where you can convene an executive session. And that's just a good handy reference to have with you at a board meeting. Sometimes your director and your council knows that an issue may be on the agenda that's subject to the executive session. Sometimes they come up on the fly, so that's a good thing for you to have. Uh, as well as, I also included, again, since the interest was library law here, on the right-hand side, uh, some links to laws and information for libraries as well. So, and um, Paula, that'll be forthcoming to you to share with all your board members as well. Um, so if there's no more questions, um, I really appreciate the invitation to um, talk about these important uh, trustee topics with you today, and um, we'd like to hear from you. So there's also an evaluation sheet on the right-hand side if you um, would like to take a minute and do that. And um, I'll be here for a little bit as well. This is my page with my contact information. Again, I'm an ongoing resource for your board. So thank you. Thank you. I'm surprised I only dropped this one.